So my name is Michael Treviso. Uh, I'm from Arizona originally, and now I'm back in Arizona, which is great. I'm happy for that. Lord's blessed me. Um, what I'm doing, I was asked to do integrative pest management. Um, okay, I said Michael Treviso. Yes, I'm doing integrative pest management. I got this hour and I got the next hour. So this class is largely focused on those who are actually looking to purchase uh, biologicals to put into your garden, your farm, greenhouses, whatever you're in, all right? Uh, so if that's not something you're interested in doing, I'd encourage you to maybe pick a second class, but if you want to learn how that works, some of the tricks of the trade, uh, that's what I'd like to talk about. All right, so let's start off with some prayer, uh, and I'll get going. I still got a couple people trickling in here. Um, all right, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here at this conference. We pray that you would please be here with us, that you give us your spirit. We pray, giving you thanks for being in such a beautiful location this morning. We thank you for the weather and the sunshine we enjoyed yesterday, and we ask that you would please be with me now as I get ready to present, and that you would give me your words and your spirit, Father. And we pray, asking all these wonderful things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I guess without any further ado, let's get started. I'm going to probably move over here so I don't keep getting in front of the screen. All right. And if anybody has any problem seeing it, I do apologize. This is just, this is what I was given to work with. Okay, so um, IPM, what is IPM? Integrative Pest Management. Does anybody here have any experience with that? Anybody at all? Nobody? <laughs> Just a little bit. So you guys are really green. Okay, so then I got, I got my work cut out for me. All right, so Integrative Pest Management is essentially using insects to kill insects. Now, I think anybody that's grown anything in here, and I'm sure several, several of you have at least tried to grow something and have had some kind of insect come and consume your crop, right? So we're going to, so IPM is about using insects to control your insect problems, all right? So we're looking for predators and preys. Those are usually what we use. So we got predators, which are prey on our insect pests, and we got parasites and parasitoids. So I'm going to talk about some of these th things, but I don't think it's right to get into IPM without getting a little bit into the scriptures. <laughs> it's just you know, in the secular world, they don't do it, but uh, we're not secular here, so I'm going to have to talk a little bit about the Word, preach at you a little bit. So, uh, so some of the biblical texts that I find are very impressive because when I read the Scriptures, especially, you know, when they were written in those days, were very agrarian lifestyles. Uh, everybody ha depended on something growing where they lived or somebody that they were directly related to or worked for them directly uh, for their substance. There was no Walmart. There was no Amazon market. There was no, none of the stuff we have today, right? very dependent. So God brought in several different, and se throughout the Bible, there's several different texts, and this is one of Psalms 105.3. Uh, I'm just going to go through a few of them. He says, I, he spake to the locusts, which, and the caterpillars, I'm sorry, it says, he spake, and the locusts came, and the caterpillars, and that without number, and did eat up all the herbs in the land, and devoured the fruit of the ground. Uh, this is one text where we see, this was obviously a, a, a problem back then, but Who's given credit here? God, right? He. In this reference, it's God. So one of the important things I want to talk here about some of these scriptures is, is, is uh, I hope you will catch, is who is actually getting credit for some of these pests arriving to consume this crop? Here's another one. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Who commanded? God. To devour the land. Or if I shall send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn for them from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. This is, again, something we have to give credit to in this particular discipline is definitely God. Ooh, wow, that looks horrible on the screen. <laughs> okay, well, this is Psalm 78, 38 through 51, if you have a Bible or uh, some kind of electronics that you can look that up uh, you can but for some of you back there you probably can't read this but I'll, I'll try to read this relatively quickly here he says but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquity this was as the Egyptian uh, as the Israelites were coming out of Egypt um, God says he he for he said he forgave their iniquities and destroyed them not yeah many 
a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath for he remembered that they were full but they were but flesh and when that passeth away and cometh not again how often did he provoke him in the wild or, or did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert yeah, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy, how he had wrought his sign in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan. I'm sorry. And he turned their rivers into blood and their, and their floods, and they could not drink. He sent diverse sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed them. He gave also their increase unto the caterpillar, and the labor unto the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail, and their sycamore trees with frost. He gave up their cattle also to the, to the hail, and their flocks to the hot thunderbolts. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and troubled. By sending evil angels among them, he made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence, and smote all the firstborn of Egypt, the chief of the strength of the tabernacles of Ham. It's interesting from this particular, not just this text here in Psalms, but throughout the scriptures, we see how God uses the pestilence. He uses the caterpillar. He uses the worm to come in and do a certain work for him to destroy crops and to essentially complicate things for them at that time and make life difficult. It was intended largely to get their attention, to say, I am God. And I s you find this script, th this, uh, these circumstances in the scriptures over and over again, and it's extremely difficult to address this problem without having to give God some kind of credit. As a professional grower, I constantly have to deal with pests. And every time they become a problem, I always ask, is there sin on the camp? Is there sin in the farm? What is going on? When I lost a crop to white flies one time, I said, well, what's going on? When I, I've lost crops to, to uh, aphids, to russet mites. Have any of you ever dealt with these pests? Spider mites, various different types of, of, of critters that are out there that show up and they utterly consume. And some of these are quick. We're talking about days. I'll go in there on a Friday, everything looks great. I'll take the Sabbath off. Sunday was mediocre. I was hardly there, maybe. By Wednesday, my crop is severely damaged. By Friday, I'm done. I'm ripping out a greenhouse. <laughs> it's that fast sometimes. How does this happen? We really got to get into studying some of these things and how the Lord works. Returning unto God is one of the problems I have, I have seen. I am very, very busy. 21st century farmer father. Um, you know, I have business I run. I'm trying to grow a crop. I'm trying to run a farm. I'm getting pulled in so many different directions. There's church responsibilities, school responsibilities for my kids. Sometimes I forget. We got to be honest with ourselves. Sometimes we forget. We don't do things intentionally. I, I don't have a nine to five. Farming is not a nine to five. A lot of times you don't realize, as, as in any business, you don't realize how much profit you're really making. And God brings things, disasters, plagues to us to remind us, I'm the one that protects you. And so many times, this is just, I'm sharing with you my spiritual, my own spiritual experiences, and I do think that other people might have actually gone through this as well, but I forget to return. I don't stop and calculate and say, oh Lord, yes, I made this profit. I think it's time I return X amount to you. But what you find in the consistency in the scriptures is that returning unto God what is God? We find this in Amos. We find this in Malachi as well. Amos chapter 4, verse 9. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increase. The polymer worm devour them, yet ye have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. What are these talking about here? Uh, Amos 4, 9. And tithing. Tithing. So many times we forget. In the Old Testament, and even today for those of us that are farming, a lot of it has to do with our crops. Right? If you plant something, Lord sends the pest, the devourer, to destroy it. But in other lines of professional business, it may not be locust, caterpillar, etc. But we got the thief, right? We got the unprofitable servant we have to deal with as, a, a, as a business owners. Uh, so we don't get away from this. 
These are lessons that God is still teaching us and showing us and working with us today. Going to uh, Malachi 8, I think most of you are familiar with this, with this particular verse. Malachi chapter 8, verses uh, 8 through 12. Will a man rob God? Oh, sorry. What are, oh, I'm sorry. Malachi 8. Uh, blah. <laughs> Forgive me. Malachi 3, verse uh, 8 through 12. Uh, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even the whole, this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me, not, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I, I, saith the Lord, will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And he shall not destroy your fruit. Amen. Amen. So I've got, I meant to print this out, I'm sorry. Uh, but... Wow, there's a lot more people in here than I thought. I was going to only do like 20. Um, I'll talk about some of these companies, but BioBest is one of the companies I went through a lot. There's Copart. There's a few other ones. If you're a professional grower, you get with these companies, they give you five pages as a price sheet of uh, different bios you can buy. And there's, I don't know, uh, hundreds, literally, of options for what you could purchase here. BioBest. And yes, and um, I meant to print this out, but there's a whole bunch of different things you can purchase for the sole purpose of controlling uh, pests, biologicals. Yet, they'll never give credit to God. But before I get into some of these tricks of the trade and, and, and teach you a little bit about this, I really want you guys to understand the importance of returning unto God what is God. The importance of giving God credit, because ultimately he is the one that controls these pests. He is the one that is going to give life to your crops, give life to your employees. For those of you that aren't farming, because I know not everybody in here is a farmer, uh, but even if you don't own a business or you're in some position of management, you're still dealing with this. You still have to deal with this. Who keeps your employees healthy? Right? Who gives you life? Who brought you out of bed? Especially after, what, two years of pandemic? A lot of us haven't gotten, a lot of us have got sick. I think almost everybody in here probably at some point got some kind of COVID or knows somebody that did. Who gives us life? Who brings us the contracts that makes us the money that we need to make? doesn't matter to the line of business. It's always God. All credit goes back to God. It always goes back to God. So if you're not in a, a farmer here, because I know a lot of this conference tends to uh, attract a lot of people that are not farmers or actively growing um, and dependent upon those crops in order to make a living, I do want you to take the time to stop and consider the object lessons you could learn from this and bring into your line of business, whatever it might be. And never forget that the credit goes to God. Joel chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. Very interesting. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the polyworm, polymer worm, my great army which I have sent among you. Who is that devouring your crops? It's God's great army. You're telling me <laughs> most of you are here because you're concerned with uh, the pests that have come uh, to devour your crop or molest your crop and bother it. Who, who's, whose army is this that has arrived on your farm? Whose army has arrived in your garden, your fields? Joel tells us it's God's army. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love this verse because when I see it, I say, man, this is God's army. This is why, go back to what I mentioned earlier, I said, Lord, your army is here devouring my crops. Why? What have I done wrong? Show me my sins, Lord. Show me my sins. Rebuke me. So this is one of the things that I tell you, you must remember. Chapter two, the second chapter of the book of Joel. God's army is in your, is in your, your garden or in your farm. Brother and sister, I tell you, you must take that time to stop and examine self. Especially for those of you that are professional growers. You must take that time. Before you turn to all these biologicals and you turn to the sprays and everything else that's out there to try to control these pests, we must turn to God. 
One of the promises the Lord made if <coughs> in the first, uh, first Kings chapter 8, verses 37 through 40, if there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locusts, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hands toward this house. Then hear thou in heaven my, thy dwelling place, and forgive, and do, and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou, only knowest the hearts of all the children of men, that they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou givest to our fathers. This was the promise that was made at the commissioning of a Solomon's temple, that if we would return to God and recognize him, that he would remove these diseases and these pests from our land and from our crop. And that goes back again to what I spoke earlier, giving credit where credit is due, giving it to the Lord before we get into this. Now I'm going to start getting into uh, the biological side of these things. I'm sorry, I want to keep track of time here because we started a little late. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the biggest enemy of an, in, of an insect is another insect. The business of or the practice of using insects to control other insects is biocontrol. IPM is a more specific part. We call it integrative pest management. In other words, we are integrating, we're bringing into your cropping system a pest to manage another pest, thus the name integrative pest management. All right. So there's different approaches we could take at this. We have predators and we have parasites and we have parasitoids. So we're going to get into what these are, these three in particular. So a predator is... Um, it preys obviously on here's a variety of different uh, pests. We have aphids, scale insects, mites, thrips, white flies, caterpillars, uh, beetle larvae. Like uh, another gentleman here, I think Frank spoke to me about some of these trees are actually hit by beetle larvae. So this is there are some ways to manage it, but I think uh, those particular beetles are still trying to figure that out. Um, so these are examples of predators that can come in and actually consume different pests. Um, here's another, here's three different co very common predators. Most, most of you are probably familiar with, everybody knows, uh, ladybugs, right? But uh, we don't understand sometimes some of their, their characteristics and how they behave. Here we have a ladybug larvae. Above we've got the adult. Here we've got syrphid flies are actually excellent as well. Uh, you got larvae on the top and adults on the bottom. And then we have lacewings larvae and then adults. adults. Um, when you're purchasing bios, oh, sometimes they'll sell you the adult ladybugs and adult larvae. Those are actually, or eggs even, they'll sell you those. Uh, uh, lacewing flies will also sell you the, the larvae and the eggs uh, and the adults. Um, Searford flies as well, lacewings. Uh, but these are all examples of common predators that we could use to manage different pests. Aphids in particular for this one um, and lacewings. I think the syrphid also, actually all three of those do uh, aphids quite well, are serious consumers of aphids. Um, then here's some more charismatic predators. Uh, unlike the previous one, these are also well known, especially the, um, the primantis there on the left. But these larger insects, they don't, they're not as hungry and they're not as prolific. You can't, they're great to have in your production system, but you can't really count on them to be curative. In other words, if you've got a heavy infestation, they're not going to wipe it out. They're just going to consume what they want, go up, leave their progeny, and then move on. But it's not really a pest that you can expect to be curative. Um, here's some examples of parasites, uh, which parasites uh, live on the organism, but they don't, con they don't consume it. In other words, they don't kill it. Usually they just slow it down. Oftentimes they make them infertile, which is great, uh, but they won't kill it. A parasitoid uh, is similar to the to a, to a parasite, but it'll actually move into the pest, consume it entirely, and ultimately kill it, or at least totally consume a section of it. So these are three different types that we have here. Uh, of course, these are all much, much smaller, and um, and uh, will some the parasitoids will con kill the host, but again, they will not destroy. Here's some examples of common parasitoids. Um, tarantula hawk, that doesn't even appear. These slides are getting cut off. I'm sorry. 
Okay, yeah, well, the, on the top left, that's tarantula hawks there. Those are actually pretty impressive if anybody's ever dealt with those at all. Um, and here we have parasitic wasps on an aphid. Here we have trichnid uh, fly on a caterpillar. And um, these are actually just, I think they still haven't released these parasitic wasps. I don't think you guys in California really have to deal with brown marmorated stink bugs, do you? Yep. Not brown marmorated stink bugs, bugs though, right? Yeah, they're a real serious pest in the East Coast and the Midwest, and they heavily affect uh, soybean fields, especially. Um, and they'll come in and they'll come into your homes, and they fill them up completely. And um, will they're trying to release this parasitic wasp, but I don't think it's actually commercially available yet. I'm supposed to hold the questions for the end for the mic. Is that okay? All right. Sorry. Um, and then, of course, there's this other one here. I think that was familiar for the oak tree leaf, but that's another experiment that they're still working at at OSU. They haven't quite finished that. Um, so here's some biological control advantages. So again, like I talked about earlier, there's some pros and cons to using this system. Biologicals won't always control everything, and there's not a solution for everything. But here's some uh, beneficial, or I'm sorry, some advantages for biological controls. So they're very self-perpetuating, which means they they keep reproducing usually, so it's not something you buy once. Well, it's something you can buy and expect to be there, but um, some will die off over the winter, but they usually they tend to come back. Uh, they're, uh, they're very pest specific as well, so if you release certain biologicals, they tend to only affect certain pests and that's it. They, they don't always affect their beneficials, except in Blissius andersoni, and Blissius andersoni is a parasitic mite that will actually eat some of your beneficial mites. That, that, that is one that will, um, will have some negative effects. They are density dependent. So if you have you know, heavy infestations, you can apply more. But if it's a light infestation, you can apply less. They're, they can be cost effective if you manage it right. It's very important that you manage it right. Because some farms, I've seen some guys that will just spend a ton of money on bios. And they get nowhere with it. So it's important that you know how to apply them, the rates to apply them. And if you do that, and if you practice that, they're actually quite cost effective. And they are environmentally compatible. In other words, they, they'll come into your cropping system and they will work with what you, your greenhouse or your farms or your gardens and, um, and bring a benefit to it. Some of the uh, constraints, of course, they're not immediately effective. In other words, it's not like a spray. You can't just come in and you know spray. It says it'll knock it down or kill whatever. So you buy it, you spray it, and it knocks it down. Bios don't work that way. They take time. They take time to come in, establish themselves, consume the target pest, and ultimately <coughs> establish their their uh, their colonies in there. Uh, they're not eradic er eradicative, but um, this is not really a constraint. In other words. Um, how do I put this in layman's terms? I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to use words that I think a lot of people don't understand because they're not uh, uh, familiar with uh, ITM. Yeah, it doesn't really kill every one of them, but okay, so what happens is you bring in these pests and they will consume the majority, but they don't consume all of it. They will never consume every single aphid. There will always be some aphid in there. You'll never consume every single spider mite. There'll always be at least one spider mite in there. But uh, I don't really see this as a problem because what happens is if you do have a little bit there, then there's always going to be some uh, predatory mites that will come back or parasitic organisms that will come back and consume them so that they always have a food source. They're always present. So if you get an infestation from outside of your farm, it's nice to have them there. So that's why I say it's not really a constraint, though some people might look at it as a constraint. Uh, biological agents are known for many pests. Okay, yeah, so there's a lot of pests out there that there are not bios for. So we don't have a solution for every problem, but we do have solutions for a lot of the problems. So it's a good idea to learn. So that's one of the uh, constraints as well. Um, they say it doesn't always work, um, but <coughs> some people will tell you, oh, I tried bios, I tried an IPM program, and it didn't control my infestation of aphids or spider mites or whatever it might be. But a lot of the times these failures are due to misapplication rates, uh, misunderstanding of what organisms should be released for what aphids, because not all aphids are created equal and not all organisms consume all aphids. 
some of them are quite specific to a certain subspecies of aphid. So it's important to know these things. Um, all right, so what makes an effective biocontrol program? High, high to complete uh, prey specificity. That means that, like I mentioned earlier, when you're purchasing certain aphid, like for example, um, there's two different types of aphids. I'll tell you later. I'll show you later. I have a slide on there with the specifics, but you got what was known as a potato aphid, and then you have your green aphids, or I'm sorry, your uh, uh, melon aphids. So those are two types of aphids that are in fact quite different, and sometimes people will introduce the wrong organism for the wrong aphid. So I'll talk a little bit more about which one that is, but um, you have Aphidius irvi and Aphidius tolomani, and both of those actually hit different aphids. The parasitic wasps, so they don't go after the same ones. So um, it's important to get the right organism for the right pest. Uh, let's see, what, uh, most of these are well adapted to habitats for target species, so they'll, you, you have to make sure that, um, for example, Cucumbers. Anybody grow cucumbers in a greenhouse? Yes. Okay, so for cucumbers to grow, all you really need is water and heat. Make it hot. <laughs> Make it hot and um, put a lot of water down. And man, those cuke vines, they'll just blow up, especially if you get over 100 degrees. But the problem is, in the summertime, growing cukes in a greenhouse, if they're over 100 degrees, certain organisms don't do so well. So it's important that. Uh, you think about what kind of temperature, what type of climate these organisms thrive in. Uh, otherwise, they will not, uh, they may not do so well. They'll actually start to heat, uh, if the heat gets too high, they'll start to um, not develop as quickly. And, it, and this is very much, IPM is very much a numbers game. And what I, I was going to do some examples earlier, but say you have an infestation of two-spotted spider mite in a cucumber greenhouse. Does anybody, how many of you do not know what two-spotted spider mite is? Wow, about half of you. Okay, well, if you don't know and you've grown cucumbers or strawberries, I'm going to tell you that you were probably hit by spider mites and you didn't know it because <laughs> they really hit those pests uh, or they really hit that crop significantly. But um, so say you find a, uh, how much time do I have here? I don't want to take too much. Okay, I got to go ahead a little bit. Say you find two spotted spider mite in a greenhouse and you think, you were out scouting and you found maybe, I don't know, I'll say 10,000, right? We'll just come up with a number. Um, I'm going to use this number a little bit more later, probably in the second hour. That's supposed to say two spotted spider mite. This is kind of not so happy as a marker. So you find 10,000 of them. You want them gone, right? You want them eradicated. This could be cucumbers. Oh yeah, we'll say you have 10,000 in cucumbers and you have 10,000 outside on your uh, strawberries. Same pest. You got to manage them differently. The reason why you got to manage them differently is because in a cucumber house, in the summertime, 100 degrees, and above is common, especially here in California. How many of you are not from California? How many of you are from areas where you don't see 100 degrees in your greenhouse in the summertime? <laughs> You're the only one. <laughs> where are you from? Canada. Canada, okay, yeah, you probably wouldn't see it in Canada. Okay, but for the rest of us, <laughs> we're definitely gonna see 100 degrees in the greenhouse in the summertime. So some insect pests will die, or well, they won't, die, I don't want to say that, but they will not multiply as rapidly as um, they will if you're, say, outdoors and it's maybe 80 degrees. Uh, this might be closer to a temperature where the reproductive life cycles are much higher and a pest that is our strategist, like spider mite, which reproduces rapidly, will actually slow down. Uh, in a greenhouse where temperature is too high. So if it's our strategist, like some of these predatory mites, they'll start to slow down. A real silver bullet for spider mites that you'd normally go after is Persimilis. Each one of those will consume about 40 spider mites in a day. 
So one persimilis mite will con consume 40 spider mites in one day. Yes, it's a mite consuming another mite. They're both, they're all fall under arachnids. They're, they're mites. I'll show you some pictures here earlier. But we can't, we can't put persimilis in at 100 degrees above, or above 100 degrees because they'll actually start to pass, they'll start to uh, slow down and it'll take much longer for the reproductive cycles to go through. And I'll get into the numbers a little bit later because I want to get through some of these slides. But we can't use that same pest. And this is why I'm saying excellent, uh, sorry, well adapted for the habitat of the target species is an important category and why I put it in here. I won't go totally into it right now. I'll talk more into the numbers later, but I'll give you just a brief idea for those of you that have never done this before. But you cannot, you cannot treat that strawberry field the same way you would treat the cucumber greenhouse for the same mite. Does that make sense? Because what you'll end up doing is you'll put the spider mites out in the strawberries. I'm sorry, you'll put the uh, persimilis out in the strawberries, you'll treat that, it'll go out there, consume, establish its community, reproduce, and eventually knock down that spider mite infestation. But if you go into uh, the cucumber greenhouse and you're dealing with spider mites and you bring in persimilis and you release it, you're going to knock down a lot. But the problem is, is that they don't reproduce as often. It takes longer for them to put out eggs and it takes longer for those eggs to make it to adulthood when it's 100 degrees every day. Does that make sense? All right. Awesome. Just trying to teach these principles to you. <laughs> All right. So, sorry, let's go to the next slide here. Okay. In addition to classical uh, biological controls, it's a, which is, you know, bug versus plant, we also use uh, viruses, bacteria, microsporidians, and uh, entomopathogenic fungi and nematodes. I'll talk briefly about these as well. So here's an example of, of, of a virus that can be used, which is uh, milky spore powder, which is used for um, moths and butterflies, particularly gypsum moths. And uh, I think they use it against Japanese beetle grubs. These are the grubs of the Japanese beetle, which are in the soil. And this is essentially a virus that they have to consume. So it has to go into the organism, and then that virus will eventually uh, kill that organism. It'll never make it to adulthood. So that's an example of a virus. Um, of course, this is not IPM, but it's biological control. You could use bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, which most people are very familiar with. Uh, and that's a bacteria that is consumed by earworms or caterpillars, and it destroys the digestive system and they die, right? Um, so these are non-lethal chemicals, but they're actually living organisms. Microsporidians, which are, controlled for, which are used to control locusts, it's similar as well, they have to consume it and then they'll, they'll never make it to maturity and they'll pass away. Uh, Bavar Bavaria bassiana is a fun fungus that you can use for um, all sorts of different beetles. This one right here at the bottom is, it's hard to, no, that's, that's not a, it's a stink bug, but it's not brown worm rated stink bug there. And you see the white all over the, uh, the beet or the bug is actually the fungus growing in there. Um, and ultimately it'll actually kill it. And then, of course, there's nematodes. I'll talk a little bit about nematodes because nematodes is something you can buy from a lot of the bio uh, companies that provide bi uh, bios for you, like BioBest or Copart I mentioned earlier. And these nematodes will, there's different mechanisms, but either they take two different approaches. Either they'll actually go into the uh, target pest and consume it and kill it, or they will release bacteria that will affect its digestion and then kill it that way. So those are the two types there. Okay. Now, I think this slide was supposed to be earlier, but oh well, I'll say it anyway. Uh, nutrition, right? It is so important that climate, which means temperature, nutrition, which is your soil nutrient balancing, uh, ensuring that that's right, as well as moisture. If pests love sick plants, another reason they're there is because your crop is sick. If it's stressed out because you're not, you don't have the proper moisture, whether it's too much or too little, if it stress out the crop, you'll end up with a pest infestation. If, uh, say, you're totally out of balance, you got way too much nitrogen, for example, nitrogen is one of them, you're gonna, it makes the sap a little sweeter and all your phloem feeding insects are gonna show up, like aphids, and start consuming your crop. So if you're pushing too much nitrogen, uh, that could be an issue. Uh, let's see what else. Proper root, if your soil is very compacted and you can't breathe properly, uh, that's another issue that it's actually gonna stress your crop out. 
and bring pests in. So some of the things you want to consider before you get into bios are climate, nutrition, soils, and then of course what I mentioned to start with at the very beginning is the Lord God. <laughs> Make sure we're right there. We can't forget that part. Oh, what's going on here? There we go. Um, yes, we have to remember as well, um, not all crops are created equal. So one of the things I have seen if as, as I've gone out to visit other farms is sometimes people would take crops that are quite different, something like, again, a very different example, strawberries and cucumbers. Strawberries, they just like a little bit of water. Cubes and all your melons, they want a lot of water. But what I see sometimes is people put both of them on the same irrigation system so that they're both getting the same amount of water. We've got cucumbers, thirsty for water, strawberries, same place. We're inundated, we can't grow. This stresses both, even though you're irrigating both of them the same. If we look at education page 111, paragraph three, no one can succeed in agriculture or gardening, for those of you that are just gardening, <laughs> without attention to the laws involved. The special needs of every variety of plant must be studied. Different varieties require different soil, right? And cultivation and compliance with the laws governing each is a condition of success. We cannot treat every single crop the same way. They don't all want the same soils. They don't want the same moistures. They don't want the same climate. We must learn what climate, what soil, what temperature, and what uh, growing regimen we, we need to practice for every single crop in order to not have them stressed out and have them essentially cross-infecting each other. Examples of that are, you're trying to grow something uh, in your greenhouse in the winter. We had cucumbers in our greenhouses over the winter. Heavily, they ended up getting infested with spider mites. Take them outside, right next to five acres of strawberries. So as soon as it thaws out, the mites go to the strawberries. As soon as it starts to freeze, the mites start going inside. So you start this cycle that is constantly going over and you can't get rid of this pest. Why? Because it's going from indoors to outdoors, from outdoors back to indoors, and indoors back to outdoors. So keeping in mind that you need to segregate these somehow or perhaps stop a crop and then move into the next crop, put some sort of break in between it so that the pest is not just going from outdoors back to indoors, outdoors back to indoors, and you never get rid of them. It's important to remember that. All right. So some main things to remember or to know about IPM. Okay, so let's just say you've got everything right now. Some important things we need to take into consideration before we get into a lot of the other things I wanted to talk about is a scouting program. If you're a professional grower or trying to be a professional grower, or aspiring to be one anyway, you need a scouting program. What that means is either you need to do it or somebody you trust needs to go out, maybe not every day, but regularly and look at your crop look at leaf surfaces. You gotta get a, 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 a lens, which is usually a ampli amplification of about 10X is good enough. You can go as high as 20X. Something like russet mites is probably, you need at least 20X ampl amplification to spot russet mites on tomatoes. Or any of your solanaceous crops, I think you can get them on uh, eggplant, you can get them on uh, tobacco, but I don't think anybody in here grows tobacco. Uh, you can get them on cannabis if anybody's growing any kind of cannabis. You can get them on, uh, what else hits russet mites? Uh, bell peppers, all your peppers. You cannot see russet mites with the naked eye. You don't even realize it's a problem until it's too late, way too late. By the time you can see russet mites, you have got trillions of them trillions and trillions on a leaf or even just a section of plant. They are so small. You have to have a lens to see them. Uh, even uh, regular spider mites are extremely small. You need 10x amplification, but you've got to be able to get out there or somebody has to go out there and find these problems with, or I'm sorry, find these pests before they become a problem. Why? Because it'll go back to a number numbers game. When you decide it's time to treat something, when you find a pest and you want to treat it, you don't want to have to buy just these huge, you know, thousands of dollars in bios to try to come in and fill, deal with the problem. You want to buy, find it when it's early, and then you buy just a few, maybe just a few thousand, release them, 
they will multiply and knock down that pest. But if you're, you realize that you have a whole field infested with whatever it is, spider mites, russet mites, um, aphids, whatever your pest is, it's probably too late. And it's not worth the time or the energy or the money especially to try to treat them with biologicals. And this is where a lot of people say, oh, it doesn't work because they want to, th th the mentality is use bios like you would use sprays. <laughs> no, that is so not the mentality. You use bios before you ever need to use sprays. Sprays should be anything lethal that you'd spray on there should be your last resort. The last thing you're doing. That's where everything else has failed. You know what? Let's just spray. And then the only thing left to do after that is rip the crop out and plant something else. So in the order, the last thing obviously you want to do is rip your crop out, especially if you're trying to make a profit from it. Last thing you don't want to do is rip it out. Next to the last thing is spray it. And then before that, you're down at releasing some bios. So definitely need to do that. Okay, numbers, numbers, numbers. I couldn't argue enough how important it is for numbers. So I have a bunch of sheets here. I was going to, I don't know how to hand this out. There's so much information I have. Uh, but you can get these kind of sheets here from BioBest, Copart, anybody that you want to try to buy biologicals from. Arbico Organics, if you're small growers or just gardeners, go, with, go through Arbico Organics. But they give you these sheets, and these sheets tell you a whole bunch of information. I could get into, uh, and these sheets, of course, are about the biologicals that you buy. So here's one about Phytocilius persimilis. I think I had one of these. Actually, no, no. We'll go into Eremoceros eremicus. Okay, that's a parasitic wasp of white flies. White flies affect... Uh, tomatoes especially in a greenhouse um, they also infest uh, flowers a lot of your if anybody does any kind of flowers uh, they will hit those flowers very quickly but anyhow this particular organism Eremoceros eremicus you can purchase in in, um, in a powder you can purchase them in a little piece of paper that you can hang on your crop with a bunch of eggs on it that'll hatch with some food and what happens is that these eggs hatch they consume a little bit of, the, of that food and then they'll eventually mature they fly away and they start um, parasitizing white fly larvae, okay? So some of the things we need to understand before we start purchasing biologicals is how many should I buy for a given production system, right? So let's just say you have a greenhouse that is 6,000 square feet. In that greenhouse you have, um, I don't know, 500 tomato vines or something. Um, and you want to figure out how much white fly, I'm sorry, how much of this particular organism you should put in there, you need to read your application rates, which will tell you something like if you read in this one, it'll tell you, um, I had it highlighted in here somewhere. Where did I do it? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, this is, uh, it says you should release, I think it was, eventually it boils down for a greenhouse that big, it, I'm just going off of experience. I'm sorry, I had it highlighted and I, I'm not seeing it right now. I, I'm going off of experience here. It would be, you would need to put about probably five to 10, the little cards need to be hung on that greenhouse. That's as a, as a preventative. That means you don't have the problem, but you're hoping to prevent the problem. So you introduce the organism to try to prevent that problem. Those application rates are small very small. In fact, for growers, a lot of the times, I'm sorry, for gardeners, a lot of the times, you need to go through um, Arbico Organics or somebody else who will sell you just that small quantity for just a few bucks. Because if you try to go to the big grow or the big guys like BioBest or Copart or uh, Griffin's Greenhouse, they want to sell to growers. So they want to sell you a larger quantity, right? So how many of you in here are growers? One, you grow, yeah, you grow, you're a grower, you know, we've got quite a bit, about a dozen or so. Yeah, and I was just saying, this is kind of like a combo. Yeah. Because it's one thing you have to do the application rate, but then there are people who only need to do the application Okay. She says she has a garden. All right, I'm, I'm about to go to questions here for the last couple of minutes. Um, yeah, actually, I might as well go into questions because we're about done here. We're almost I, out of time. I, I This is what I'm talking about right here. Okay, so actually I just spoke my last slide. So yes, all right, we'll open this up for questions. Okay, I'll answer your question what I think you're talking about, and what I think you're talking about is um, most likely cabbage loopers. So it's little eggs that are laid by little tiny moths that show up. 
they lay them under the leaf, they hatch, they're born, they eat the leaf, and then they go back down to the ground where they cocoon. So by the time you notice the damage, they're already in the soil pupating to become a moth. Where do all the pupating happen? Um, in the soil, you could try uh, nematodes, which I'll talk about. Uh, to spray on the crop, you want to use Bacillus thuringiensis a bacteria organism that you can purchase sold largely as Dipel. Dipel is its most common. Um, yeah, there's other generics, but Dipel, you, you don't worry, probably don't want to buy Dipel as just a grower because it comes in a big bag and it's kind of expensive. But you can actually go to your gardening section. They got these little spray bottles by Bonnie is the name of the company. And, and you should find one that has, make sure the key ingredient is Bacillus thuringiensis, and it'll destroy that. Okay, next. I'll go. Um, for squash bugs, I have tried Spinosad was one, but the difficult problem with spraying uh, squash bugs is that you, they, they're under the leaf. So as you try to approach a squash bug with chemical spray of any type, it's hard to physically hit them because these are all contact sprays, right? And they're all underneath the leaf. Um, let's go back to this side. This guy right here, I've somewhat, um, yeah, I'm trying to get this thing placed where I'm trying to slide. There you go. Okay, this guy right here, um, a wheelie bugs. Well, actually, yeah, it's a predatory, uh, uh, a predatory, what do you call it, bug that consumes bugs like Japanese beetles. I think it'll do some squash bugs as well, but the thing is, you, it's only as a preventative, not as a curative. In other words, these guys don't consume enough to suppress a population that's already very well developed. So you shouldn't be in the greenhouse, so maybe that one could have been. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. What's the name of that again? Wheelie bug, like wheel bug, W-H-E-E-L. Assassin bug, yeah. You could try looking them up as assassin bug. That's what one of the things they're sold as, as well as wheel bugs. But that's only like moderately effective and only really as a preventative and not as a treatment. It's not going to knock that down. Okay, another question. I'll, the gentleman in the back there. Is that you? Were you asking a question? No? Yes? Sorry. No, I was referring to you. So then with your squash bugs, you're saying certain fungi work on pests? Uh, yes. You could try them, but I, I have not had much success with B Bavaria bassiano. Okay. Which I had so a picture of it in here somewhere. Just to save that, that answer, there's a special squash bug that you're never going to try to describe. So there you go, that one, Botanagard. There's a technique on the locusts uh, with that effectiveness also in capturing the rat bites. Yes. Um, and, uh, no low bait is what it's called. That no low bait is what it's uh, sold as over the counter. You can find it online. Oh, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, this is a picture of it right here. It's called no low bait. This is a this is a picture right here of the label. And uh, somebody else is asking about that for uh, where to go. Bavaria or Botanagard is what it's sold as, which is Bavaria bassiana. That one works for squash bugs. Some, but I think that one's marginally effective. That's been my experience. I haven't been, I have not had much success with Bavaria bassiana on any beetle. And the reason being, so the reason being because this, again, um, has to, first off, it has to have physical contact with it, right? And it's very susceptible to the sun. And most of the places that have squash bug issues are places that are very sunny. So um, it destroys the spores before, or sorry, the sun, UV light will destroy the spores and before they will hatch on these bugs. And that's why it's been marginal with squash bugs and it's not super effective. Okay. Another, I don't have any of that. Just to your place, you said as far as introducing the biological presence, not in the greenhouse or you know, even in the field, what's the best time to introduce that biological control? Would it be at transplanting? At transplanting, yes, and right at the beginning. But remember, okay, so you wanna, okay, so the question is what is the best time for, come on. The question is, what is the, when is the best time to introduce the biological controls into a greenhouse? And the answer is, as soon as you plant them. 
but to be more specific is you first off you need to introduce them at the preventative rate which is going to be a much smaller number and you want to do that as soon as you plant especially in a greenhouse and especially if you plan to keep the tomatoes there for you know 22 to 46 weeks or depending <coughs> on what your growing lengths are you want to introduce those pests as soon as you plant them at the preventative rate especially also if you know that you had the problem last season okay next question ready in the pink Okay, the question is, what can you do about the, uh, the pests that go into the ground? One of those in particular is cabbage loopers or earworms, which will pupate in the ground. So that means they consume the plant up to their last larval stages. Then they go into the ground, make a cocoon, bury, stay there, either they'll overwinter or they'll come up, you know, usually just within a few days or a couple of weeks as a, and reemerge as a moth. And... Uh, Nematodes is one, one effective means, uh, but really the best, the most effective, just practical results is to use Bacillus thuringiensis while feeding as larvae. Can you like mention the two other ones? Um, the okay, so let's see. There it is. Okay. BT. Which one is? Oh, sorry, the left one on the left, right? BT. So. A lot of you guys have probably heard about BT corn. So BT corn is a corn that's genetically engineered to produce the same exudates that bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis produces that actually kills um, caterpillars and earworms and things like that. So it's, it's using the same mechanism, mechanisms except this is natural while your BT corn uh, or cotton has been genetically engineered to produce this, this same uh, exudate. I'll write this. Let's see if I got a good one. Okay. Well, I'll take a question while I'm writing. From right here. Yeah. Yeah. What did we use for DH? Okay. She's asking. <laughs> she's asking about cucumber beetles. Every year you have cucumber beetles on what kind of a crop? Cucumbers. On cucumbers. Okay. And squash. And squash. And weeds. And, well, the weeds are beneficial. Here in Northeast Texas, are yours the little ones with white and black stripes on them? They are yellow. I'm sorry, yellow and black stripes. Stripes and stripes. And stripes. So you got both. What did we use? Knock those down. I can't remember what I used. I'm sorry. I haven't dealt with that one for off the top of my head. I'll be back. I know that I. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm digging back there because I remember I did something to knock those down and I can't remember what it was. But I want to say I used potassium salts of fatty acids to spray them down, which is like MT. Yeah, it's an insecticidal soap, but you got to make sure the bottle says potassium salts of fatty acids. That's the key ingredient. You see, the thing is, sometimes you go and you buy these products over the shelves, and uh, they'll tell you, oh, this is an insecticidal soap. I think I saw one somewhere. I don't know if it was Home Depot or Lowe's or one of those kind of big box places. And uh, the active ingredient was not the active ingredient I was looking for. So find one with the active ingredient that I believe that was it. But I, I'm... I want to say that I might be wrong on that. I, I'm not feeling very warm and comfortable about telling you that one, so I might be wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, you can buy Pyganic, um, which is pyrethroid or pyrethrium, um, but that is expensive. I know a one gallon jug is like three or four hundred bucks, but that that lasts uh, lasts a while. Ah, that's the one. Yes, um, conserve SE. That's what it's called. Sorry, as soon as you said spinal sad, it came back. Spinal sad knocks down a lot of those beetles. Yes, this one, A and B. Spinal sad. I, it's a mask. I can't tell who's talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> so if you're doing battle with recall tomatoes on plums and truots, um, it seems like getting the leaves off early in the fall is a good measure. Also, as part of the management, I've been using a dormant wild spray. How does that interact with um, beneficial to develop against uh, maybe dying of your larvae in the spring? 
I don't want to kill off the oh, okay, okay. organic matter. Okay, I'm having a hard time understanding what the question actually is. I'm sorry. The interaction between dormant oil spreads during the, during the winter and possible damage to um, beneficial fertilization in the spring when there is a killer problem. Okay. His question is he uses a dormant oil spray to manage what pest was it? It's kind of a generic like scale. O okay. Oh, for scale. Okay. Yeah. And he want, he's wanting to know what effects it has on, a, on aphids that overwinter. Uh, on, on the beneficials oh, beneficials in general. In oh, okay, the I beneficials. Don't my beneficials. Oh, you don't want to hit your beneficials. Okay, so um, aphids in particular, well, there's a lot of different pests that will consume aphids. Ladybugs is one of them. But the thing with ladybugs is that they, they naturally, the instinctive, once they're done consuming, they fly away and they go somewhere else. So the chances of you affecting your ladybug population is nil unless the neighbors don't have any. Because those ladybugs will eventually some will, should come to your farm. And uh, if even if you think you're knocking them down, uh, making applications rates of, uh, uh, let's see here, like if I were to use that example, I would go with, uh, yeah, you want to do a daily adoctrinata eggs. Yeah, like. This is what something you would buy right here. See, it's listed right there. A day, well, am I on the right one? Yeah, here we go. Yeah. Adalia E system, you get about 100 yeah. eggs for like 25 bucks. You release those in there, they'll hatch, and you'll get larvae that'll consume about 200 aphids or so. You can buy them larger quantities, you know, that was just one example, but you should get a list like this from your grower if you're, if you're an actual grower. All right. Do I recommend a book? You're right, this topic is way too big for two hours, but um, a good book. <laughs> you know, guys, I'm sorry, I did not learn what I know by a book. Um, I learned what I know by being in the industry <laughs> and through college, but otherwise I, I don't know what book to it's recommend. It's source, though. Uh, research papers, how do you get this knowledge? Um, actually, like I mentioned earlier, so experience. one is experience. Okay. First off, this is a big industry. The greenhouse industry is a big industry, and the greenhouse industry is very tight-lipped. They don't like to tell you their tricks. I'm telling you tricks that you're not going to find out there very regularly, just from the industry, from being in the industry. Uh, I don't know a really good book, but what I could tell you, probably my advice for you guys who you're, you, you don't know anything, you're very green, is YouTube University. Go to YouTube and start watching things like especially BioBest has a ton of videos up there. Uh, Copart has videos up there. Um, what is it, BioControl I think is the name of a company. They've got quite a bit of videos up there. And then another company, uh, Arbico Organics, is another one that I believe has a number of videos. And then there's a bunch of videos out there from all the different university extensions all over the country. Okay, now that you mentioned that, so he said if I could mention a book that could tell you the yeah, bug, it yeah. looks like. So the best book I have seen for pest identification, you guys ready? Write this down. Yeah. <laughs> University of Massachusetts uh, Extension Service Pest Identification Guide 2016. That's the best guide that I have ever seen for identifying pests. So it comes from UMass. Oh, boy. University of Massachusetts, right? They came out with a pest I a guide, pest identification guide, right? So they just call themselves UMass. That's the University of Massachusetts. Uh, pest identification guide. Um, I don't know what volume it was, but it was uh, 2016. That's the year that they released it. And that one has, I mean, that one is so kindergarten. It's almost nothing but pictures. Nothing but pictures. It tells you exactly what they look like. So they have one, f there, so there's one for fruits and vegetables, right? So there's one for your vegetable crops, veggie crops, we'll just say veggie crops. Um, and then there's another one. 
pest of wood, woody ornamentals, I think, which is the or, or, orchard. So you were orchard, orchard right? Yeah. yeah. So for those that are um, have orchards, I think in the back you're orchards too, right? Maybe? No? Okay. Um, um, woody... I believe that was the name of the other one. The other one was Pest of veg Veggie and something else. I can't remember. And the, th the man, I got to beg your forgiveness because I meant to bring those books and I didn't bring them. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Okay, I don't know how much more time we have here. Can we? I guess I'll take some more questions. Audio verse will chop them up. Uh, we're pretty much done as far as time wise. We're totally out of time. But I'll answer more questions if you guys want to answer. Those of you that are ready to go up and. Take some more classes. Um, you're welcome to do so. Spotted wing drosophila. For spotted wing drosophila, um, as far as I've been able to tell, there are no IPM management for. There is no IPM management for that, and they're using uh, traps to deal with spotted wing drosophila. Traps. Spotted wing drosophila is especially difficult with um, raspberries and a few other fruits. I have not dealt with leaf-footed true bugs, so I have no advice. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be real with you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure I could figure something out if I did a quick search, but I've never dealt with it. How practical is all of this for the small garden person? It can be very – okay, so how practical is all of this for the small garden person? It can be quite practical, but you have to just – you have to learn. And most people don't understand it. It's you know. It's just, it's a little bit more than simple, you know, <laughs> but it can be done. The part two is a continuation. It's going to be a continuation, yeah. Yeah, I was just curious about that. Um, oh, yeah, I'm just picking, picking up where I left off. Where it's like, there's three classes I want to be at, right? So I'm curious what would be your take on. Well, my next one, I'm really going to get into the how to apply. I mean, it's going to be very just, awesome. if you're looking for the information, sit down. I'm about to give it to you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, no, what I was saying is that they're releasing these uh, parasitic wasps for them, but I don't think that they're readily available in the market. So that's the only thing I know of right now. Brown bomber did stink bug. Oh, the stink bugs? No, they have um, almost everything, but especially soy soybeans. So if you live anywhere near a soybean field, you're going to have all these stink bugs. Yeah, um, and I know that some of them have actually come in and attacked tomatoes, and they started actually, originally they were really on soy, soybeans, and they've kind of started to get out and get on other crops. There's still a new one because they're new to the North America. So my stalker is like a, a, a flower stick, and it's going to come down out of the sky and just be spinning and just destroying it. I was going to talk about thrips and how to manage those. The ones I'm going to get into, if you're interested, I'm about to get into aphids, two-spotted spider mite, thrips. And what was the other one? I forgot. I, I swear it was the fourth one. But anyway, uh, the different uh, the different organisms that you can release, uh -huh. and what numbers and how they and, and what their messages are. Um, you, I don't know if that interests you. Oh, it totally does. That's the problem. Is that there's this one and two others that I'm. You're, you're stuck in. So, uh, what time is the next I one? I guess I'd be curious if I could find you later and get the names of the suppliers. Sure. Of yeah, I'll be around. We have a really, really good natural population of um, ladybugs, um, and I have seen how magical That's good. it is <laughs> in our greenhouse. That is great. Um, that is great. They'll take care of all your aphids. Complete yep. crop loss, but it, you know, we still have aphids, but we're not losing crops. Well, Which we can get the aphids yeah. totally but out. I mean, unless your your nutrition is just way out of whack, that you have that you're just you're breeding aphids. Uh, which could be the case too. I've been working with Whitmer McConnell on my soil nutrition for him. Okay, so that you should be somewhat closer, but you're getting closer. But yeah, I've seen, but usually with aphids, I like to hit them through different different routes. I got, I, I want to go first off. I want to go with ladybugs, right? Larvae. Yeah. It's sure. important that you have the larvae yeah. because the larvae consume a lot more than the ladybugs. Yeah. An adult ladybug will consume maybe 200 yeah. aphids in its entire adult life, while a larvae will consume 56 a day. Yeah. <laughs> A larvae, they are hungry. They're like teenagers just going around, eat, 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 eat. Yeah. And they'll just tear up a whole bunch of aphids real fast. But then if you bring lacewing bugs into it, and then you bring uh, 
person from WASP, both the Irvine, and you're putting the right one in there, then you're really going to, I've seen fields just <laughs> totally in, infestated with, I had what, two acres of watermelons. Totally covered in aphids. I thought it was done. I, was, I gave up on it. And then I left, and I went to go deal with this. I come back like two weeks later, and they were almost totally gone. <laughs> they couldn't see them so many. There was just lady beetles, lacewing bugs, and, um, and parasites wasp. Everything you could see the little, car the little uh, carcasses left over from the eggs from the parasites. They don't know. No, no, sir. Uh, no, uh, they look at it as uh, what do they call it? Uh, yeah, pretty much uh, proprietary information. Yeah, it's proprietary. I mean, if they started sharing everything they did, then everybody would do it, right? And then they'd be out of business. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. They're supposed to take my uh, powerpoints and put them up. Yeah, eventually. They're supposed to put my powerpoints on Audioverse too. Um, I don't know. Yeah, sometimes. I don't know what they're doing this time. What time is the next one supposed to start? I'm all confused. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So hopefully we'll get a crowd back in here because I was really going to get into the real serious <laughs> stuff. <laughs> now well, I lost the crowd. Yeah. So I can, the, the whole idea was the integration of, you know, kind of all the conservative ways, especially with biologicals and uh, organic friendly sprays. And well, trying to get it all to fit without disrupting yeah. a minimal amount of disruption. That's why it's called management, because you want to manage these organisms right. on your farm and you don't want them to go away. Right. And so it's kind of like, that terminology is just this big umbrella, right? And then underneath it, you have more specifics. So biological controls right, is right. really more what I'm focused in. But if you don't have a good management program, then you're going to go and you're going to buy these sprays. You're going to come back. You're going to spray them. Then you're going to kill all these bios that you just paid all this money for. Right, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's just one of those things where it's like you don't want to spray unless you really absolutely have to. That's why I was saying you bring in the bios before it's a problem. Because by the time, if you're spraying, you shouldn't be spraying until you've reached the point that you've exceeded your economic threshold. You just, you, you can't. If you don't spray, you're going to lose your crop. Right. And you're going to lose a lot of money. Right. But then even then, you use the sprays, and a lot of times that only knocks it. The sprays will never kill 100%. It doesn't matter how toxic or right. how fancy it is. There's no spray on the market that will kill 100% of anything. Right. It usually, at best, you'll kill 98%, so which means that 2% is going to be there. Is what you have left is going to be stronger for it, and so next year. And then you breed, and that's how you breed resistance because right. that two percent or whatever it is that survived that spray will eventually come back and produce a new population, right? So right. you spray it again, you knock it down again, and right. then well, well, you knock down, you know, another right. ninety-eight or whatever, ninety-five maybe, I don't know, and now you end up selecting for resistance against this spray that you're using, right. and this is why a good spray regimen calls for different sprays. You don't ever spray the same thing back to back. You need to shift right. and use different sprays. Right. Otherwise, you end up selecting for resistance, genetic resistance of that spray. Right. 